Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar uh, for the event for the Lethens Le Extension Wind Farm proposal. My name is Robin, and I'll be your host for this evening. We'll kick off by going through a couple of housekeeping, um, if you've not been to one of the webinars before, of how to join in. So you'll see me present uh, a few, few slides over the next 20 minutes or so, just sharing some of the information about the proposal today. The, the webinar software has uh, a question mark in the top right hand corner. Um, if you click on this, this is a chat box, and you can type in a question anytime you like. And we'll answer those questions once we get to the Q&A following the presentation. Don't worry, for any reason we don't manage to get to your question and answer it directly today, we'll collate all of the questions and comments that we get today, and we'll put them into a Q&A document, put them online, and email everyone a copy of that once we've gone through the process of the consultations today. The website itself also has a feedback tool where you can leave your details if you've not done so already. And it's a great place to uh, see information about the project, uh, answer in polls, which are on there as well too. And um, yeah, so with that, we'll just get cracking. So as I mentioned, my name is Robin. I'm the community manager for the project. I've worked with banks for about uh, the last 12 months. And uh, I live in Glasgow with my one-year-old daughter and partner. Uh, so if you do hear some noise in the background, uh, <laughs> someone screaming, it's it's her, uh, it's, it's her bath time, so <laughs> she's just through that wall there, so we'll do our best to keep it down. Uh, I grew up in St. John's Town of Dolry, just over the border at Galloway, and uh, so relatively nearby, uh, I know the area very well, very familiar with uh, East Ayrshire and New Cumnock, which is where this proposal is based. It's really important to me that we Take, uh, take into consideration the community's views and make sure that we, we strive to create a positive difference in the region together where we can. So moving on, a little bit about uh, banks, if you don't, don't know us and haven't, haven't heard of us before, we are a family owned and operated business. Uh, we care deeply about making a positive difference in communities. We began uh, mining coal in 1976 and we've transformed the business over the last four decades to include uh, property and renewable energy. At the heart of who we are is really a values-based team whose core approach centers on maintaining a, a strong sense of duty, building trust with our partners, meeting commitments, and adapting to the needs of the community, and of course, the technical innovations needed to supply affordable clean energy. So moving, moving on into a bit more about how we approach things at banks, we have a, an ethos called development with care, which is our approach to our values and our beliefs with our work. We are not an organization which is just here for the short term and a quick buck. We're here for the longer term and believe in making a lasting positive difference. Um, and this means we take care about the relationship that we have with people and planet and the impact that we have on the communities in and around our, our projects. So we have four pillars for that. The first being uh, the environment, which is about delivering positive environmental legacies from our projects. Uh, secondly, community, about supporting the wider community both for the areas hosting the projects directly and also nationally too, working together with our business partners, uh, so fair practice with them, uh, helping them to work ethically and sustainably um, and work with local supply chains, and then with the workplace, which is how we treat each other at banks, providing a safe environment and development for our people. Moving on to some of our activity uh, locally here in Scotland, just wanted to give a bit of an insight into some of the uh, renewables projects that we have nearby. Um, as part of our transition to renewables, we've developed and operate a number of projects across the UK, uh, growing enough capacity that will generate power that meets the needs of over 134,000 homes. So our Scottish projects alone deliver significant capacity and large community benefit funds. And we, the renewables function, are ourselves Scottish-based team in Hamilton, uh, who all care about delivering meaningful and high quality projects for the market that we live in. So we're excited by expanding our reach and helping Scotland deliver its net zero and climate uh, ambition uh, through good jobs, thriving communities and uh, cutting edge technology together. So moving on a bit on how we actually do, do that, a number of years ago, and based on our values, uh, together with that ambition to make a lasting positive difference, we embarked on a journey to establish a charter that sets out how we'll secure local employment investment with our projects. 
Our mission was to collaborate with local partners in, a, in such a way that build wealth and resilience and a local voice into communities where our projects are situated over the longer term. So a truly sustainable model to meet the needs of today and future generations. And the mission is fourfold, to maximise the benefits available for each of our wind, wind farms for local people and for the local economy, to create new employment, training or education opportunities for local people, to directly support local businesses, to encourage them into the supply chain, and to support the establishment and work of local community advisory panels or groups for individual projects um, to help us identify what's important to them for good causes. So moving on to a bit of that in action. So it's important that our investments impact the local economy and invest in a way that supports local people into employment. And that Connected Renewables initiative was designed to do this not only for the construction of the wind farm, but beyond when it operates. Yeah, so during the, the recent construction of the Kitemuir wind farm just over the border in South Lanarkshire, £16 million pounds, uh, was spent with local construction suppliers within 30 kilometres of the site. Uh, so that was just the construction of that one site. And our investment in local communities through the community benefits from that wind farm and the nearby Middlemuir wind farm annually is uh, just from those two projects is, is uh, just under £700,000. Pounds. And part of that goes into the, the work that we do in collaboration with the local authority, which supports Connect to Renewables through an employability initiative, um, which helps people into uh, jobs, into employment um, or to education opportunities. And just in the first two years, it's managed to help 400 local people into training or, or employment uh, alone. In addition, the Kitemuir Community Partnership delivers community benefit funding directly to where the local community's needs are. And those decisions are taken at local level uh, through a partnership of community councils in the region. So something we're really proud of there. Um, moving into just a few examples of the work that they've done together with the KMCP, um, we, that Kite Your Community Partnership, as well as supporting each of the community councils towards delivery of their community action plans. The community funds have been brilliant support during these challenging times, been a very strange 12 months for everyone and very, really, really difficult. Some people have um, you know, faced a lot of difficulties and they've responded in a fantastic way, uh, adapted to the needs of the community. Um, and it's been really great to see them see their work over the last 12 months. And just a couple of examples there was a group called Working Together for Avondale, who managed to, I think it was something like 1,700 free, free meals that they managed to provide the community with over a number of weekends, um, especially when the pandemic first hit and, and people didn't have resources to be able to do that themselves. Um, so, so really great examples there. So that was a little bit about uh, us and who we are, just a bit of an overview um, at Banks. And it brings us on nicely to our, our first poll, which you can take part in yourself. Um, so I'll, I'll get this going. It's a nice, simple one for us to kick off, um, just to get a sense of who we have in the room. So our first poll is about, do you support renewable energy? So it should come up on your screen. I'll launch that myself. So just click one of those. Uh, do you support renewable energy? I'm not supportive, supportive, uh, or not supportive, supportive, and extremely supportive. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that one. But if you could click on one of those, that would be fantastic. Give everyone a bit of time to think and click on the one which is important to them. A little bit more time, those of you who are. Have a wee think. There you go. Some votes coming in now. I'll give another five, ten seconds, people to who've not voted already to make their views felt. And we'll close the poll. And just share what we got there. So a 50-50 split of the audience for, for supportive or extremely supportive, so no one not supportive. Very basic question there, of course, but it does give us an indication of, of who we have in the room and you know how they feel about renewables projects in general. So a good one to kick us off, and now we're comfortable with the polls. We'll, I'm sure, fly through the next two that we have coming up later on. So um, move, moving on to uh, the proposal itself. So. What is the proposal? Um, just put it on a map there of, of Scotland, the southern part of Scotland. You can see that Lettons and the proposed extension that we're discussing today 
just situated to the northeast of Newcomnock in East Ayrshire. And um, so I'm sure you're, you're familiar of, of where that is in a broad sense. Um, and moving on to a little bit of a snapshot about the existing uh, consented project, which has not been built yet, but that's a high level summary of that project. You can see it's uh, 22 turbines, um, 105.6 megawatts output with a maximum tip pipe of 220 meters. Re really significant investment in, in the region. Um, there's lots of stuff in there. Um, large, renew large community benefit fund of over 15 million pounds, a 5% community ownership offer. And, and we think around about 440 jobs will be, uh, or training opportunities will be supported through the uh, an employability fund as well, which we've um, made part of the package there too. The build itself will have a 90 million pound investment, 40 million pounds of which will go into the Scottish economy. It'll be nearly 140 jobs directly supported during the construction alone. Um, looking down at the environment, it's obviously a huge project, um, and that will of course do, you know, great things when it comes to displacing uh, carbon from the energy grid and support Scotland meeting its net zero targets and ultimately uh, helping uh, when it comes to combating climate change. So that's a significant project. Moving on to the, the, the uh, Lethens extension. So this is an extension to the consented wind farm, which is the proposal that we want to discuss today. So that would be in addition to those numbers that you saw on the previous page. So there'll be a further, in this proposal, will be a further 11 turbines with a maximum tip height of 260 meters with approximately 66 megawatts of output. That would be an additional 42 million pounds of Scottish construction uh, investment, an additional 33 million pounds of business rates to the local authority. We think around in total pipeline for the lifetime of the project, about 400 jobs directly supported and just under 10 million pounds for the benefit fund and then similar figures in terms of the environmental impact on top of those you saw previously. So a significant uh, extension to the project. And if we go into the next slide, we can start to see um, those two sitting together from a timeline perspective. So we, we kicked off in February with uh, a, putting a scoping report out. And really, today we're really sharing the contents of that scoping report um, to the wider audience, the wider community. We've had some uh, conversations with community councils and so on, but this is really for the wider community to, to share their views. So that brings us to June. Uh, over the summer, we'll go through a design process based on the feedback that we've got so far from these events. Um, that feedback will go into the design. We'll then uh, come back with some proposals to the community. And hopefully the, that next time we come back, uh, those future consultation events towards the end of the summer, up to the tail end of August, we'll do those face to face. So we'll have an opportunity to come to the community and, and, and meet people and i um, genuinely looking forward to that after being stuck in, uh, stuck in our offices or living rooms for, for the last 12 months. So that will be very exciting for us. Um, the planning application determination period will take us up to about January 23. We anticipate that the Lethens Consent to project would be begin construction at that point and the construction of the extension, if consented, wouldn't start about, until about two years after that. So they would sort of dovetail nicely together. Um, so likely operational, the consented wind farm lethens, the main wind farm 2025, and that's extension 2027. And ongoing through all of that is a community dialogue with, with you to make sure that we're, we're good neighbours. So why have we chosen this site? Well, it, it comes down to access, access to a number of things. First of all, to a good wind resource. And you can see there from this map that Scotland is, is covered in totality by the highest possible wind resource um, that you can see. And, and obviously that makes it a fantastic natural resource for this country. And we also have access to a grid connection, which allows us to both distribute the energy locally and nationally. Um, we have access to existing infrastructure from the consented wind farm, of course, when that gets built. There's also access to site via a robust port. Uh, and a road network, and one that in the main has delivered similar sized components before, as well as that access to fantastic local businesses and local supply chains. So this this does this is a natural, uh, logical move to put a wind farm in, in the next to the consented um, site that we have at Lethens. So looking a bit more in depth and detail about those two things, where they, 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 they sit together, you can see there from the map, there is uh, the, the 22 turbines of the consented project. 
Just to the northeast of that, you have the proposal that we're discussing today, uh, which would be 11 turbines in addition to that. Again, those tip heights up to a maximum, up to a maximum of 260 meters. There will be any of the turbines in the proposal over the 150 meter mark. There would be a need for aviation light uh, lighting. We'll be erecting one meteorological monitoring mast. Uh, there will be associated turbine infrastructure, including foundations, external transformers, and create hard, hard standing and laydown areas. Uh, there'll be a site control building and substation compound. There'll be underground electrical cabling and communication cables between the turbines and the site control building. In addition, there'll also be some temporary elements during construction, so a construction compound. All of that will be fleshed out during the detailed design process of consented. Um, we anticipate that the site access and transport will be through the uh, same point of entry as the consented wind farm lessons, which is uh, through um, New Cumnock and up to towards Cumnock to that point. Moving on, we just wanted to sort of tackle that that question directly about why do why do we need to look at tall turbines? Why do these make sense? Well, cleaner, taller turbines, in essence, are have higher efficiency. They have access to to cleaner wind flows and higher wind speeds, meaning the turbines can reach a maximum output more often. Uh, it allows for a larger rotor diameter, um, which allows in itself for larger power capture area, again, increasing the energy production. With both of these combined, it enables us to contract larger, more powerful machines, which on this site could lead us to reduce the number of turbines and providing the same, if not more, energy, uh, green electricity. Um, and fundamentally, that all leads to uh, lower cost of energy to build, which leads to lower household energy bills and a higher community, community fund. So there is a, a sound sort of sense, sensible and logical argument as to why the tall turbines um, are being uh, proposed or part of the proposal. So what will we look at when we go through the design considerations? So these are the elements that we will consider over the summer, which will then feed into the design. We'll be looking at so the, the neighbouring properties to the site um, and just making sure that we uh, take on board the community's feedback in relation to uh, viewpoints and properties uh, and actually we do have a landscape architect out this week who's been out on site um, and is producing ready to produce visualizations based on feedback that we've had from the community about positions and perspectives that we need to take into consideration when it comes to this proposal which we're absolutely doing we'll take into consideration noise assessments uh, the telecommunication links uh, and, and around the site, the water resources, the ecology and ornithology, the ground conditions like peat and deep peat, uh, the topography of the area, any protected habitats or any relevant archaeological and cultural heritage assets. So there will be lots of uh, detailed assessment going on in the environmental impact and these considerations will all go into the design that we, that we, um, that we come back with uh, later in the summer. So looking at a little bit more detail about what we'll do during that period from a consultation perspective, we'll of course continue to work with community councils and we already have a good relationship and we'll continue and build on that. Um, we'll have direct input from community members. Um, we, we, we love to have conversations with people individually. If we need to, we'll um, also, in addition to obviously the online consultations, but as restrictions have, have will begin to reduce, uh, I will be in the region and you know, I'd love to hear from you and, and speak to you and meet you myself. Uh, we've obviously got these online consultations, website polls, there's a feedback tool in the, on the online. Um, we've already distributed thousands of flyers within 10 kilometres of the site, um, a little bit further away, uh, depending on, on, on where the population centres are. Uh, we will hold a design day with key collaborators and partners to produce that design. We'll also hold some workshops with key stakeholders and community groups and the community councils themselves. As, well as meeting some key residents, particularly those who are close to the site as well too. So um, moving on, that brings us fairly nicely to uh, our second poll, which I'll launch. Uh, the, the question for this poll is what are the most important factors for us to consider in that design? You can answer more than one uh, on this poll if you so wish. Um, so I'm gonna launch that, that now. And the options are total number of turbines in the design, uh, the visual impact of the wind farm, preservation of natural habitats, preserving trees on site, and the height of the turbines in the design. 
don't worry if there's something which is more important that's not on this list. Um, you can just type that in the chat box and we'll address that later later in the Q&A. So if you could just get your clicker out and click on which of these you think are the most important. So maybe a bit more time. You could just make sure that you click on at least one. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to give it another five, ten seconds just to make sure that everyone's made their choice. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to close that poll and share the results. So <clears throat> We had the strongest response for the preservation of natural habitats, an equal second the visual impact of the wind farm and the height of the turbines, and third place preserving trees and the total number of turbines. So really good info uh, from the, the group today. So thank you. And we'll take that into the design process and we very much appreciate your participation. So um, moving on to the community benefit, just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of where we are today and in order to do that just share a little bit of the context of the consented wind farm and looking at that extension about how we view those two things sort of fitting in together or supporting each other so the Lethens consented wind farm would have a pot just over 15 million pounds uh, the first chunk of that is allocated to to the renewable energy fund for which East Ayrshire Council uh, allocate so it, in principle, that's for applicants within a 10 kilometer radius from the edge of the site. Um, then there's an equal amount of uh, money, which is put into a community benefit fund, which will be a partnership with the community, which will work together with the community councils to form, um, who will then administer and make decisions on, on what the nature of that uh, funding should be in terms of how it making a sustainable and positive impact in the region. And that will be taken at local level. In addition to that, there'll be 1.3 million jobs and skills fund, which will collaborate with East Ayrshire Council to deliver. The, the community councils that are named there will be the recipients of, of that jobs and skills fund or people who live in those regions. Um, we'll have a, a 250,000 pound access strategy for the site. We'll partner with the local community in East Ayrshire Council to deliver that. And we have a 5% community share offer, which we have two development trusts interested so far. For the extension, there's a 9.9 .9 million pounds pot which is based on that 66 megawatt number and if the final design is less or more it may drop it down but assuming it's it's that site that, and that capacity it'd be that 9.9 .9 million pounds and what we want to do today is if you if you have any ideas or feedback about how you think that we should invest that to support the existing project or otherwise uh, and we want to make sure that we take that feedback into the proposal as well too so quick summary of the community benefit. So we wanted to just have a just a quick poll just to get a sense of what uh, the view of the room was in relation to that community benefit. So it's our last one of the evening before we go into the Q&A and I'll just launch that. So which of the following are the most important community benefits? The creation of local jobs, community benefit funds themselves, so the pot of money, generating green electricity or investment in local businesses. Again, you can click on more than one, uh, but we would be interested to hear your views on, on which you think is the most important. And of course, if it's not listed, put it in the chat box and we'll tackle the question in the Q&A, which will be coming right, right after this. Okay, um, so I'll give another five, ten seconds for people to make their views known. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, 
We'll close that poll. And the response was, well, everyone felt it was important to consider the community benefit funds. So second place, the creation of local jobs and equal third, a bit further back was the generating green electricity and investment in local businesses. So clear, again, a clear response there from the, from the people who have attended today. So thank you very much for taking part. And we'll obviously take that into the design and the further steps that we take. So, um, so you've heard me rabbit on for long enough. Uh, but hopefully we've got a decent understanding of, of where we're at today with the proposal. Um, you know, lots to you know, lots to go through, and we've, we've not even got to the design process, and etc. So now is a really good time to make your views known. We'll kick off with a, a Q Q and A. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we've got uh, got a good one. This is probably for you, Clara. Um, so I don't know if my private water supply and catchment lies within the proposed site. What are the proposals to deal with this? Hi there, um, Clarence Thompson, I'm the land manager for the project. Um, so as part of the design process, we are in a dialogue with the council's environmental health department, um, along with speaking to local landowners to get their local knowledge of any private water supplies that are either within the site or in the vicinity of the site. Um, if there are any private water supplies identified, um, we'll make contact with the relevant properties and we will take these into consideration during the design process. They will become key features and we will obviously seek to mitigate any impact on them. Um, we've employed specialist consultants to do this work for us and they're currently undertaking the work, so we should have the results of that in the next few weeks probably. Brilliant, thank you very much Clara. Excellent. It's a really good question. We've got um, a good question here, uh, which I think is going to be for you, Amy. Um, I have a concern about the water courses and wildlife on the site during and after construction. How will we avoid disturbing this delicate habitat? It's a really good question. Um, as you were touching upon earlier, we've had this site on our books for quite a while now. The last couple of years, we've been undertaking ecology surveys and bird surveys and checking the habitats. So we've got a really good understanding of what's on the site, which means that during the design process, we can actually try our best to design the wind farm infrastructure around the sensitive habitats. And the, if there's any kind of signs of water goals, etc., we'll make sure to avoid them as well. During construction itself, um, we will control various measures through um, construction environmental management plan, employee pollution prevention plan, that kind of thing just to make sure that we're minimizing um, any negative effects where we can. Um, post construction, we will make sure that the natural habitat is kind of um, is re established as far as we possibly can. So we'll reseed areas, we'll replant trees, and we'll um, employ a habitat management plan. So we'll work with Nature Scott and the local council to agree what kind of objectives, if we can improve the area, if we can maybe increase. Um, the attractiveness for, for certain species, so we'll do that kind of thing. So, um, rest assured we're looking into it um, and we'll make sure we'll minimise all effects where we can. On, on mute uh, there for a second. Haven't we all done that at one point <laughs> in the last year? But um, brilliant question, great response. Again, these will go into the Q&A which we'll compile, we'll put online and we'll send a follow-up note. So if you weren't, you didn't quite catch any of that, or you had another question that didn't get answered today. That will all go into the Q and A. Um, Alan, I think this one for you. Uh, would Mansfield Road leads up to the site. Is that going to be widened? Um, hi, Robin. Uh, yes, I think the the uh, the access road to uh, Rue Mansfield Road is. We're not, and we're not expecting to do any direct widening works to that particular section of road. But uh, we are clearly going to be working with the uh, with the residents on that road to minimise any of the, uh, the 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 disturbances through uh, through the, the, the vehicle movements that are going to be coming into the site throughout the construction and throughout the operation. It's clearly something that we need to we need to make sure we work very closely with that community in particular to uh, to minimise the, the impacts. Brilliant. 
thank you, Alan. And uh, it's definitely something we take on board there about that, that road up to, to the site. So we'll um, we'll come back to the community and the local community council about how we approach that Mansfield, Mansfield road directly too, because we know that we've got um, you know it's definitely some an issue which we need to make sure that we have a plan for. So thank you for that question. Um, we've got a question which I, th I think is for me: uh, Why are you limiting the distribution of feedback? flyers to a radius of 10 kilometers. I think it's actually a little bit of a typo there. It's not just limited to 10 kilometers. Um, the distribution was uh, mapped around the population centers. So we would make sure that we got uh, Cumnock and, and uh, you know, surrounding uh, villages and towns around there. Um, part of the reason why we don't put a lot more out there is just to do with, you know, there's a lot of it to do with, you know, cost. It, it can be quite expensive to go into the larger towns in, in Ayrshire. So we pick a um, we pick a, a radius which which makes sense, and obviously the, the key is to make sure that we have access to all of the properties within that local region, so that everyone, particularly in those rural locations, are able to um, you know get involved with the consultation itself. Um, so, those for the person who posted that question, if you if you want to speak to me directly about that and give me some feedback of where, where, where else you think that we need to uh, talk to when it comes to the consultation. I'd be happy, more than happy to have a conversation with you directly um, because we absolutely want to improve and obviously we have some further events coming up later in the summer once we produce the design so um, it'd be great to be able to speak to you at some point. Uh, we have a question around the aviation lighting uh, which I think will be for Amy. Um, what do you mean by aviation light, lighting? Um, they will be lit so the planes don't hit them question mark yeah pretty much so in the uk any structure over 150 meters needs to be lit um this is so that planes can see them and uh, so the pilots can see them so when we talk about aviation lighting we're talking about um we're basically light there's three or four lights up the tower um which will be visible um we haven't done our detailed aviation impact assessment yet. We're going to be doing that once our layout is set and we'll discuss with the various different stakeholders, for example, Ministry of Defence, Presswick Airport, um, to see what they would require. Um, and hopefully we can maybe minimise the adverse effects on people in the area by reducing the intensity of the lights or potentially through um, shielding, which is where the light is kind of angled up the way as opposed to down onto the, onto the thing. Um, but we'll come back with more detail on, in the second event about that. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, Fraser, to get you involved, we've got a question. We, we covered it a little bit already, but wh why do we need to go so high in terms of the tips of the tur turbines? Just to get the technical guy to explain reasons why, my, after my shoddy explanation earlier, but Fraser? Yeah, no problem. Cheers, Robin. Hi, uh, Fraser Harrison, the technical lead on the weapons extension project. So, I mean, the, the main reason for the, 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 the tip heights being so high is to just increase the efficiency of the turbines. We're on a forested site um, at the weapons extension, similar to weapons, and the wind flows are basically just cleaner and, 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 and freer um, as you increase the, the height. Now, there's also a bit of uh, future casting here in the, in the development of the project. Um, to ensure that uh, you know the, the, the turbines are up to date, and uh, you can see with other projects and planning that it's not too far off, um, to, to, uh, you know, it's not too much more than, than other projects and planning at the moment, and it's really where the, the industry is trending, especially in the, the central and the kind of southern area of Scotland. So you know, it, simply it's to increase the efficiency of the turbines, um, and you know that that makes a makes a more efficient design, a cheaper design. And a cheaper kind of electricity generation for everybody um, as well. Thank you very much, Fraser. Uh, question: Thank you for going over over the response again and a bit more clarity um, for everyone. We got a question around uh, why is REF being paid to East Ayrshire Council, who also get rates benefits, um, and only forty two percent goes to local communities who have who, uh, who live with live with the wind farm. So the REF is actually, whilst it gets paid to East Ayrshire Council, the, the funding itself is for the communities who, who live in and around the region of the wind farm itself. So people can apply to that fund to get funding through the REF. So it's not for East Ayrshire Council, it's for the communities. And just on a point of, just to be specific about it, 
as it stands today, for the proposal that we're talking about today, which is the extension, it is carte blanche about how we intend to use that community benefit fund. So if if I guess what you're saying with the question is that you know you, you feel that it would make sense to think about that community benefit funding in a different way and not use the REF, because that REF component that we talked about was for the, the consented wind farm lethans, which is um, you know, which is a already you know previously consented project and that's been agreed already at a prior point. So I'll I'll sort of infer from your question that you know it's worth a chat about maybe a different model. Um, and again, I'll you know reach out to that person um, if they want to, or if they want to get hold of me directly to have a conversation about how they think the community benefit fund should should be um, should be structured. So hopefully, I've answered that in a sort of roundabout way. Um, with that, uh, I think we could be at all of the questions. I'll just before I go into this final, what happens next? Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else with any questions that they've not answered and they feel that we should? We should. Um, if you could just post it now, um, that would be great, and we can answer it. But also, don't worry if you can't think of anything now. We will. Um, we'll obviously you know, be able to answer your questions after this event. It's not a one-time, uh, you know, one opportunity to do so. So. Okay, I don't think we're getting anything more through in the chat box. But so what happens next then? So we'll collate the questions that we've gotten from today and the responses that we've given. And what we do with them is, as I, as I mentioned, we'll put them in a nice, easy to read Q&A. We'll pop that online. We'll send you an email if you've registered. You'll get a link to it. You click on it, you can read the questions and answers. Um, obviously, it'll be well thought out and well considered at that point. It should be nice and easy to read and that'll be sent out to everyone. Uh, importantly, our team will take your input into the design process and then produce a proposal based on this. A full public event will take place with the proposal and obviously we're looking forward to back to face to face. Um, and we'll continue to partner with the local community and community councils and the local authority to, to produce that. Uh, so you can get a hold of us in lots of ways, old fashioned way, you can write us a letter. Um, you can visit our website, you can email us, uh, you can call us, uh, follow us on social media, sign up for newsletters or, or through your community council. And uh, I'm happy to uh, take a conversation with you personally as well. So you can contact me um, I'll be monitoring that email box there if you want to speak to me um, or you can dial that number and it'll go through to me if you, if you uh, speak to the reception too. So very much eager to speak to people in the community uh, about this project. So um, with that, I think a big thank you to everyone involved, first of all, who put this together and made the event possible. But a uh, big, big thank you, most importantly, to the people who've attended this evening. Uh, I'm sure lives are very busy and it's turned out a nice, lovely evening here in Glasgow. So I know everyone's very busy and it's not always easy to get to these things. So big thank you for coming. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll wish you a good night and hopefully see you soon.